Good morning and welcome back to the MBIA Disorders Association first ever, ever for virtual family conference. It is hard to imagine that almost a year ago, this was just an idea, but here we are. And thank you for being part of this important event with us. We are so happy you're here. Before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to remind you all that we have several social events happening over these four days. Today, we have an adult social hour and a very special guest who will share her favorite drink recipes, followed by an open forum for us all to have a little bit of fun together. And also, don't forget to check out our photo booth, which can be accessed right through the main conference page. We'd love to see photos of you all having fun enjoying the conference at home. We are so fortunate to have Danielle Boyce here with us today. She is an award-winning patient advocate and researcher who has a deep interest in epilepsy. Her work has been published in scientific journals and her children's book, Charlie's Teacher, is used in hospitals throughout the country. She is the data standards director at RareX and was recently appointed to the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute's Rare Disease Advisory Committee. Danielle and her husband have four children, including Charlie, who has Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, a rare and severe form of epilepsy. Please join me in welcoming Danielle. Hi, welcome to the history of patient engagement and regulatory affairs in the United States. I'm Danielle Boyce. First, I, I kind of want to ground this conversation in um, the making of my own advocacy career. I did not start out as a patient advocate. <clears throat> I started out as a uh, research data analyst at Johns Hopkins. I have a master's in public health with a concentration in epidemiology and biostatistics. And so I was working in my dream job and uh, uh, sometimes in rare disease, but, but mostly uh, in, in not COPD and asthma, pulmonary conditions like that. And then you can see the little boy on the left came along and changed my life. This is Charlie. Uh, this is when Charlie was a baby and he was having an EEG, something that you all probably are very familiar with. Um, you're also going to take a trip down memory lane of my different hairstyles in this presentation as well. Um, but at any rate, I was working at Johns Hopkins uh, as a data analyst using those biostatistics and epidemiology skills when Charlie was born in 2010. And Charlie had a very rare and severe form of epilepsy called infantile spasms, which many of you may be familiar with. It is a often absolutely devastating condition that can cause um, ongoing seizures, which Charlie has. Charlie has Lennox-Gastaut syndrome now. He just turned 11, uh, which represents daily seizures and a severe intellectual disability. So I take care of Charlie. I'm his caregiver. Uh, and he needs 24 hour supervision and care. So what does all of this mean that I am a, an epidemiologist with this training working at a top hospital? Uh, how, what does that mean in terms of making me an advocate? It means nothing, I knew nothing. <laughs> I knew nothing about epilepsy. I knew nothing about patient advocacy. This is just not something that I learned. You really have to experience it. So I can relate to many of you who may be new in this world and just don't know where to begin. It, it really didn't matter that I had all of these uh, academic and professional skills when it came to having a child with this. I had to go to the Facebook groups and Twitter and I had to learn just like you all did. And, but having these skills, the research skills helped me to um, work on areas that I identified along the way as um, having gaps in our advocacy uh, for my son's condition and in other conditions as well. So on the right, you see, this is about five years into my advocacy career, about five years ago. Here I am as um, presenting some of my research where uh, my team uh, funded by a pharmaceutical company uh, developed a refractory epilepsy screening tool for my son's condition now that he has Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So we uh, noticed that people weren't getting diagnosed uh, enough uh, properly. They just weren't being identified. So they couldn't come into support groups and they couldn't get care. So I was able to use my statistics skills and my uh, study design skills and so on to, 
to work on this team. And that's a lot of the work that I continue to do is combining my advocacy and, and research work. And I found a very happy place doing that. Just again, to remind you all, this has been my life <laughs> uh, for the last more than a decade now, uh, Charlie getting an EEG and getting into trouble. Uh, very lucky that Charlie is ambulatory still, feeds himself still. Uh, here I am on the left, another hairstyle. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Charlie after his first brain surgery on the left. He's had two surgeries to remove his frontal lobe and temporal lobe on the right side. It's a palliative surgery to help control some of the seizures. And again, with the EEG, didn't know anything about an EEG. They didn't teach me that in public health school. So <laughs> had to learn all about that and all the medications and so on. Um, so all of this to say that I am an advocate, but I'm also a student of advocacy. I went back and got uh, my doctorate. Well, actually, I'm just finishing up my dissertation now. Um, all my coursework is done and I've taken my comprehensive exam, but I'm otherwise, uh, I'm going to be doctor mom here pretty soon. Uh, but I went back uh, to get my degree in public administration because I'm very interested in advocacy uh, as a uh, area of study and other advocacy groups and all the work that they have done to get us here. So this is one of my favorite subjects. What's kind of funny about all of this is I remember as a little girl uh, in 1980s, I was uh, 10 in 1985, um, following the New York City AIDS activists uh, in what was absolutely terrifying time for them. Uh, there was a uh, gay men's health crisis in New York and then ACT UP uh, was another group you may have heard of. Uh, I lived in New York State and so we had access to WPIX New York channel and I was uh, used to watch the absolute devastation that uh, AIDS was having in uh, many communities. And this was a topic that uh, came up a lot in our home, uh, our, our worry for for the, especially the gay community, but all communities. And it's funny because this all lay dormant, this concern, this feeling, this knowledge, this history, until my own child developed a condition that had a lot of areas of weakness that needed to be addressed in a regulatory fashion. And I remembered all of this. So it's just interesting how it all has... Uh, come full circle. And so this is a collage that shows a lot of the actors and incidents uh, in the HIV uh, AIDS crisis. And some of it is kind of difficult to look at. And I'm aware of that, but this was the time. So at the time, if you were diagnosed with AIDS, it was absolutely a death sentence. It was not, HIV was not something that was chronically managed. Um, it would devastate an entire circle of friends in a month, in a week. And there was no treatment. And the population that was first to get uh, a lot of the cases, to have a lot of the cases was gay men. And they were stigmatized and marginalized. And so that made them less likely to get help. This was a time of great homophobia. This was a time of secrecy. This was before the internet, everybody had home internet and could look things up and share information. This was a different time. And these people were dying. There were experimental drugs in the pipeline at the FDA and patients wanted access to these medications. They wanted to be able to say how risky it was, what risk they were willing to take uh, in order to try these medications because there was literally nothing that could be done. And so they, they were desperate to have this. And not only that, but to, to collect the data, to have the, the data collected on their experience taking the drug to be used to further science. So they wanted to participate in that way. And they were hitting a lot of roadblocks because there, there was not patient engagement. I don't know how to explain this <laughs> or put a, 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 a bigger point on it, but there was not patient engagement with government, with um, interactions like we all experience now, like we're experiencing here probably at our conference when we have different regulators we're talking to and uh, we have uh, industry groups here with us uh, today. We have we had none of that. 
We had none of that back then. And while there were a lot of patient advocacy groups around and doing wonderful work, this was different. This was a connection with regulatory affairs that we had not seen up to this point. And you can see all of the, the people who were involved just to remind you. And then, you know, we had Arthur Ashe and Ryan White and Magic Johnson. And pretty soon there started to be an awareness that this uh, affected more than uh, gay men. And um, more people started paying attention. Unfortunately, that's what it took. But um, politicians were silent on the matter. It was absolutely devastating. In the middle here is the, is the AIDS quilt. Uh, Princess Diana did as much as she could to raise awareness, hugging people with AIDS to, to help reduce some of the stigma. Um, but um, it, there was an absolute sense of desperation. So one of the things that these uh, heroes, these AIDS activists did for all of us uh, was to help to create organizing principles around their activism. And this is something that other groups I've worked with over the years have followed suit with and have done themselves. I'm working with a group right now that is uh, putting this something like this together for their condition. And so what they did was create the Denver principles. And there, it's a document, you can look at the whole document, but I, I just pulled this out. It's just some, some examples. They got together as a group. Remember, no email, <laughs> no uh, text messages, cell phones. This was faxes and snail mail and phone calls and old fashioned uh, answering machines. And I just really want people to think about that, uh, about the kind of activism that that, that required and, and patience and perseverance. Um, an organization, but they, they got together as a group and said, all right, this is what, these are our demands. This is how we expect to be treated and how we expect to participate. I encourage you to look this up, this full document and more about the history. It's so important to be a history of, of patient advocacy as a whole, uh, rather than just focusing on what's happened in your own disease state. So they wanted to be included in all AIDS forums with equal credibility as other participants to share their own experience and knowledge. This is not something we did before these guys did it. And still they weren't heard and still no change occurred. So what did they do on October 11th, 1988? They took over the FDA. This is a nonviolent protest but they were not messing around. And if you look in the upper left, there's, there's Dr. Fauci because he was in charge of that office at the time. And they were desperate and furious. And this got their attention. Again, it was nonviolent, but can you even imagine? And this was all organized. Again, fax machines cell phones. And they did this, they did this for all of us because now we have a voice in regulatory matters. And this is this particular image, I looked for it last night. It's not currently on the FDA website, but this is where I got it. I, I got it. And they have the same content on the FDA website, but just not this particular image. But I wanna share this with you because this was from the FDA itself saying the evolution of patient engagement in the FDA. Look at the very first thing, the HIV AIDS group, uh, patient group was founded. Well, guess why that was? <laughs> because of this, right? And so this is where these Denver principles came in because now we have a voice at the table. We have a seat where we are partners in this. and. The extent of our partnership has evolved over the years, but this was a great game changer, what they did for us. And so now you can see FDA patient representative program uh, was created. Now I was a patient representative for years um, through the FDA for pediatric epilepsy. I think technically I'm still on their roster uh, because I get emailed every now and then to see if I have experience with a certain condition or not. And I encourage you to look into that. Just go to the FDA patient engagement website. That is a, a rigorous process where you're selected and trained in all of these matters related to the FDA and regulatory affairs. So helpful, so useful to have this training. And it was useful for me and I had taken health policy and those types of classes before, but it was still really great 
experience. And then they will call you when they have an issue pertaining to your condition or your area of expertise, and you can give testimony or advise in various capacities. Um, I was also a voting member of the Pediatric Advisory Committee. Um, and th these were committees uh, that were uh, when a drug was under consideration for approval, we would vote that 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 should be approved or not. Um, and, and I would get all the briefing materials and it was really, uh, really great experience and an important experience and informed a lot of what I know now about patient advocacy because I interacted with so many other advocacy groups who were involved with the drugs that we were reviewing. Uh, so you can see all of these great things that the FDA does now, but just a reminder, we have our, our friends in the HIV AIDS community to thank for, for much of that. And here's just another a list of some of the, the many things that the FDA is doing. And I encourage you to contact uh, the FDA patient engagement group. They are wonderful, easy to talk to, very informative, and this is their job. This is 100% their job is to engage with the patient community and individual patients. You don't have to be the head of a group or anything. You just be interested in this topic and they will point you in the right direction and help you to get involved. So furthering this evolution. So the 21st Century Cures Act, patient focused drug development. It's important for you to know about this. So the FDA, because of this 21st Century Cures Act um, is required uh, to consider patient experience data. Um, so they have to give a statement about uh, any patient experience data or related information that was part of the application. So traditionally, the data that was under consideration was just data related to the clinical trial, the actual endpoint, wh whatever that might be, a, some biomarker or six minute walk distance or something like that. But now it's the patient experience data. What else was considered? How how was other data factored in? Um, and the FDA must issue guidance on the collection and use of patient experience data. Um, and that seems to be kind of evolving right now, um, but there has been some guidance published and the FDA must report on its use of patient experience data and regulatory decision-making. So this is something that we never would have talked about before uh, this evolution of patient engagement. We never would have talked about this notion of patient experience or real world data. You'll hear real world evidence, natural history studies, uh, claims data, um, medical record, electronic health record information, things that uh, typically were not considered as part of a package for approving a, a, condition, a, a drug. And here we are, New England Journal of Medicine. So real world evidence, so this got their attention. So people were talking about it and um, different ways to include the patient voice. And here's just something that, um, I, I, that ties in with this work with the FDA. So this wasn't something I did as part of the uh, FDA patient uh, uh, representative program, but because I was well known to work in this condition, infantile spasms, infantile spasms has a, a drug called Vigabitrin that my Charlie took or still takes actually. Um, and it was part of the REMS program, which is a, uh, a program that uh, the R is for risk. The is, is a program that helps to regulate uh, drugs that have uh, kind of a dangerous safety profile in some cases, um, but that it's worth the risk because like with Charlie's case, he's having hundreds of devastating seizures every day. Uh, it's, it's worth uh, the risk of a, a, there's some evidence of peripheral vision loss in, in long-term use with this drug. So they put, they approve it, but you have to go through extra monitoring and, and, uh, you can only order it through certain places and you have to certify that you have eye exams, for example, um, as, as the, that's the trade-off for being able to get medication. And there's another drug, for example, um, it's for acne and it can cause birth defects. So you have to show that you're on birth control and check in uh, over time uh, in, in order to take it. But they feel that that is worth doing um, the risk of that as long as it's well monitored. 
um, is worth it if it means that this disfiguring acne can be addressed. So it's the same program, but let me tell you, bureaucratic mess. If anybody's ever, even still, I mean, it's gotten a little better, but not, not that much better because like I said, he's on it now. Uh, so all kinds of problems with the actual execution of this. And the problem is you have this new parent <laughs> with a new baby who has infantile spasms and all of a sudden they have to go through a specialty pharmacy. Like they've never done that before. They have to call uh, and, and they have to certify all of these things. And meanwhile, every second counts with this diagnosis. This, if the, the longer you wait with treating it, the more likely the, the brain damage is, is to occur. So I was not happy about this. We had gone to the hospital. The hospital can't have a, a supply of it or couldn't at the time, couldn't have a supply of it uh, because uh, they, they weren't part of the, you know, wouldn't have been regulated by this REM. So it had to go through me. So I had to bring it in and check it into the hospital. And then they lost it at one point. And this is when Charlie's having brain surgery. So somebody had to go home and wait for a delivery that I had been on the phone for two days for, you know, in order to receive this delivery of, uh, from FedEx. And, you know, at this point it's affecting outcomes at this point, if it's happening like this to me with my education and health literacy and ability to navigate these systems, imagine some, like I said, young new parent, um, just out of high school trying to negotiate this, maybe English, not the first language. So something had to give. Something had to give. And the eye exams, uh, the situation was ridiculous um, because with Charlie is he couldn't, uh, he's, he's profoundly intellectually disabled, so he couldn't participate in eye exams like, you know, what is that? Is that an A? Is that a B? You know, and so on. Um, and that's the kind of eye exam that they wanted him to take. And it was just a huge burden. So at any rate, I participated in a lot of conversations with the FDA ar around this. And finally, at one point, they asked me to present at a hearing. So there I am and, and, and with the podium, all the cameras and everything. And as it turns out, somebody wrote an article in part about my work here, uh, which I happened to find a few years ago. I was searching for something else. So uh, they did make changes. They did make changes to the program. It is easier for us now. We went back on it um, and it's, it's easier now to get it. Um, but these are the kinds of things that if you connect with the FDA, that you can be pulled into. The other thing I wanted to mention is PCORI. If you don't know what PCORI is, you should make yourself familiar. And again, I, I want to emphasize that this isn't just for leaders of groups, but this is for any individual with an interest and passion for patient advocacy. Something that I found since doing this work with Charlie for epilepsy is I've been touched in, in, in a lot of ways by different diseases and have a perspective. Um, my father had colon cancer. I have type two diabetes. Um, I had a friend who had glioblastoma. And so there's, there is a lot of room for patient voice, even if you are not uh, the, the leader of a movement. And I, I just want to emphasize that. And even if it's not your, your child affected, uh, it, it, th these perspectives are really important. And so you should look for other ways to support other conditions as well. So the PCORI, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, is um, not a, a regulatory agency. It's not like the FDA, but it is um, uh, uh, authorized by Congress. And it looks at a very specific kind of comparative effectiveness research that in, in, in it uses uh, patient engagement as a really important pillar of the work that they do. And so researchers applying for funding for their projects must have a really good patient engagement plan. I serve on the Rare Disease Advisory Committee, and it is my honor to do that. We review uh, different materials and uh, advise PCORI and different matters related to rare disease. I'm also a merit grant reviewer. I encourage you to go to their website and look that up. Anybody can be can apply to be a merit reviewer is my understanding, um, but uh, definitely ch check it out because then you will get the opportunity to review grants that in areas where you don't have a conflict of interest, and 
comment and grade score them in, in areas. Um, so there's scientific reviewers and as a stakeholder reviewer, patient reviewer, I look at things like how they're engaging the community. Did they engage the community early enough? And that sort of thing. There's a very specific criteria, but this is a great way to be involved in research. And through that regulatory matters, because all of this leads up to uh, regula regulation. And in, in many cases, it can lead to insurance approvals. It can lead to prescribing practices. So all of these things are interrelated. So even if it's not a, a drug development, a study, which these would not be, these would be comparative effectiveness studies usually. Um, I just encourage you to look into that and, and see because it, it really does make a difference in, in the overall work that we do in, in rare disease and beyond and non-rare disease too. So the other thing I've added to this presentation, I usually give this talk and I don't include rulemaking, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit about rulemaking. As part of my doctorate, I studied rulemaking extensively. There's a couple of different kinds of rulemaking, but, um, but I'm gonna speak kind of broadly about it here. Go to the Federal Register. Here's the highlighted section here, federalregister.gov. So agencies, after legislation is passed to authorize a, a regulatory body or a program or plan. So let's say like the REMS program is an example, the, the one with the risky drugs, right? Agencies are often required to open up their planned rules, the rules for how they're implementing the program. Um, they're required to open that up for public comment. And if you know where to look and where to comment, you can comment uh, on, on these. And the agencies are required to follow up with those who commented and summarize them and address them. And in some cases, and sometimes it results in them starting from scratch and having to, to redo or even withdraw their proposed rule. So it's really important that you keep an eye on the federal register. And now it's really sophisticated. You can sign in and do different settings and notifications and things. Um, but this is a really great way to give direct feedback. And it's funny, I work a lot with the ALS community, Lou Gehrig's disease, which has a lot of regulatory challenges. And I looked at a proposed document. So oftentimes I'll do draft guidance for industry on a certain condition and um, th th there will be a comment period. And they had draft guidance uh, for an ALS document and it received more than 1400 comments from everyone from industry who might be affected, like drug companies, to patients, to caregivers, you name it, physicians, and they have to summarize and address those. So that is a way for you to have direct influence and, and your community. So keep an eye on the federal register and um, think about creative ways to, to stay on top of that and, and different ways to, to comment and make your voice heard. That is a much more direct way to have involvement in, in government and, and in really in policy and rulemaking um, than even being involved with, uh, you know, having a legislature in your district who is putting forth uh, legislation. I mean, this is a very direct and specific way. You can say exactly what you want. The other thing is uh, that is, I don't mention here is when there is a, a, a public hearing on a drug. So let's say there's a drug that affects your community there's often announced in the federal register a public hearing on that drug. And in, in some cases, you can get on the docket to come and speak at those hearings. And a lot of the times when I was a uh, advisor, a patient representative and sitting on these committees at, at the FDA, there would be a period of time where the public would come in and it's very well organized and they would uh, give a statement. So they'd get five minutes or something to make their voice heard. And a couple of times it was overwhelming and powerful, this collective testimony. So this is something really important to think about as an option for you. It's not always easy uh, when you're a caregiver or a, a disabled person yourself. And sometimes that you can do statements by video or have somebody come and read for you. But I just want you to be aware of all of these things, all of these little ways, but they add up and they make a difference. 
And this is just something I wanted to share. And many of us have seen these, but um, I, I really didn't understand the value, the impact of this type of campaign um, where you put in your information and it connects you to your representatives. It has a prefabricated letter uh, in it that you can edit and then you can send it and it goes automatically to your representatives. I didn't realize the importance of this until I, I studied public administration and poli sci uh, for, for my doctorate. Um, this is really powerful and legislators have staff that keep track of these things. Um, they have connections, they have contacts, they might reach out to you for other things. So it's really important, really, really important to get involved in to, in, with your legislators and as, as the, your overall strategy for your, your regulatory affairs. And, and to get to know them personally and their staff. I, I have friends who have worked in a specific matter related to infantile spasms. Uh, and one of my friends knows all the different offices uh, of his senator and the, the staffer at each office, he knows them by their first name and has all of their email addresses. That is no small thing. That is not futile. That is definitely something that is worth doing and investing in if you wanna beef up your, your kind of regulatory connections. And just a few other things that are kind of adjacent to the work that, um, that we do in, in regulatory. Uh, this is a, a Infantile Spasms Awareness Week several years ago. And I had won an award for my advocacy. This is Dr. Wheelis uh, from Tennessee. Uh, who's wonderful. And he was the physician advisor and I was the you know, patient and we went on the satellite media tour. I don't know how many outlets, maybe 15, 20 outlets, radio, TV, and so on. Raising awareness is a great way to have influence in regulatory matters uh, in, here in the U.S. because you know, it's just like then they say, don't taint the jury pool, you know, by having them listen to things and hear things online. Well, they hear this, right? You go on TV, you raise awareness, you talk about your story, people in a position of power will hear you, will see this. They're people too, they watch the news. So raising awareness, just like you're doing, is so important and never underestimate that, the importance of, of all of these little matters and all these little efforts so that is important too. And I just pulled these up the night before one of my presentations about this topic, um, just to give an example of all the different ways that um, advocate, advocacy groups uh, do this work. And I, and especially with social media, because what would those AIDS activists done with social media? I can't even imagine uh, what they would have been able to accomplish on top of what they already did, the miracles that they already worked. Uh, but uh, here's cure epilepsy. Again, be a student of advocacy in general, not just of your condition that you're interested in. Learn from other groups and, and team up with other groups wherever you can. I think a lot of the times, especially with genetic diagnoses, we break off into silos after that diagnosis and, and we don't always talk to one another, work together. And so it's really important just to think about this in terms of a uh, of advocacy as a discipline, which is my interest uh, with, with my doctoral studies. Cure Epilepsy has this great podcast, 20 plus years of impact from the kitchen table to cutting edge research. They're definitely worth following. I'm so interested in them. Insulin for all, this hashtag is so good. You learn so much. So if you know anything about insulin, insulin is ridiculously priced. Uh, type one diabetics will die without it. Insurance coverage is often abysmal. So they have so much good advocacy uh, and, and our friends, in, including some that I work with. So I work with some, uh, one in particular of the original AIDS activists now, what an honor, original folks who are involved with what I shared with you here. And he is teamed up with Insulin for All because we're all in the same boat and these are the same methods and we, what's good for them is good for us. So very important to branch out and, and learn and, and offer your help to other groups when they're in a crisis. Um, here is a, a, a great uh, tweet. Here we have uh, people doing um, um, you know, congressional uh, meet and greets and these you know, visit days and people who are affected going to the office, organizing these lobbying uh, days, that's really great. 
Little Lobbyists, if you don't know them, uh, they're a terrific group. Again, I love this idea because it's you know, what we all have in common are children with disabilities, um, but not necessarily the same exact condition and how we can use our voice uh, to influence policy. Uh, here is one of these great uh, multi-stakeholder projects. And here I am pregnant with one of my kids. I had two more kids after Charlie. Um, but this is a, a group of researchers in the most beautiful multidisciplinary way coming together to, to prioritize research questions. So now it's not just that we want more research, but we want our priorities to be factored in. So um, look how far we've come. And uh, finally, I just wanted to show you uh, just the influence of patient advocates in our day-to-day -day society, and sadly. But this is a jacket you've probably seen before. It was on an album cover. Um, if I die of AIDS, uh, forget burial, just drop my body on the steps of the FDA. That was from that original group of AIDS activists. But this is from Parkland. If I die in a school shooting, drop my body on the steps of the CDC. So the influence and activism that uh, we've had as patient advocates has gone far beyond patient and healthcare. Here I am at a run, a 5K for pediatric cancer. I love other, as I said, I'm a student of other communities and other advocacy. Here we are with Charlie. The minute the gun went off, we're going in the wrong direction uh, because Charlie had thrown his shoe <laughs> into the crowd. So I had to go find it, but um, happy to take any questions. And here we are, a uh, happy family. This is two of my kids, uh, Charlie, we're pirates for Halloween and, and my little Nash is a parrot. And please reach out anytime, ask me any questions. I'm happy to be a resource for you and help you to connect you to the right people. Thank you so much for having me. Danielle, thank you so much for a great presentation and for all of the ways that you've advocated for the rare disease community. Um, I'm gonna kick us off with a question and then pull some questions from the chat. But can you tell us what advice you might have for those who feel a little unsure about how to advocate in our community? It, can feel overwhelming figuring out where to start. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend as a first step? Yeah, and and I that's a great question and you know I certainly my level of involvement and the different th activities that I've been willing to to do and participate in and interested in have changed over the years and um, and some of that is just due to where I am with how I'm feeling about how much I want to share uh, and and how happy I might feel at the time, because as we all know, I mean, this is a journey of a lot of ups and downs and there's a lot of sad things. And a lot of times it's, uh, you know, frankly, there's some activities that are, at, let's say walks or runs or things. And when Charlie's not having a good easy time, then it's more of a burden for me to participate in those types of activities. Conferences sometimes are hard for me, which is why I love these virtual settings. Um, so the way to start is to start wherever you're comfortable, start you know, all politics is local, you know, start right in your own hometown, start in your on your Facebook page and whatever you're willing to share. You don't have to share all the details of your life. If you're not comfortable, you can say, hey, I'm affiliated with this group and check out their website. This is what, you know, Charlie has. That's kind of how I started, I think, um, because I was unsure about how much I wanted to share about Charlie personally. And then I'd look around at others and it would feel like they were doing more or, they were, you know, they'd see people like me certainly, and they would think, oh, I need to be like that right now. But I wasn't like that. Like I said at the beginning, I wasn't like that at the beginning. Um, and so, so reach out, the way I call it is planting seeds. Just start reaching out to people. The one thing I wish I knew at the beginning that I know now is that people really do want to hear from you, even if you don't have a plan. Even if you don't know what you want to say or do, you just want to get involved. And, and these people, especially at the FDA, that's their job, 100%. And they are thrilled to have people reach out because they want to be able to say they have this many people reaching out to them and talking to them. So definitely don't be shy just because someone has a PhD or something. Don't be shy to, to reach out and talk. Um, you know, really, this is something that um, a lot of groups, a lot of regulatory groups and clinical groups, research groups are hoping for more patient engagement. So just remember that and that you have a lot of power there. Thank you for that. We have another question in the chat. Uh, Marianne is thanking you for the insightful and great information. When is it appropriate for an MBA, MBIA patient to contact the FDA's patient engagement office? And would it be done to advocate for a treatment or drug or 
trying to get a drug compassionate for use. So just really like, yeah. what is it that they want to hear from? Yeah, them? that's a great question. And you know, this is where strategy comes in. And this is where it's great when you have a group like the MBIA, because there's a strategy with, with certain, certain situations. Uh, so, so generally speaking, they want to hear from you, even if you don't have a specific agenda. So for me, I was told, Hey, there's a group is how I got into it. I was told there's a, there's a group at the FDA that, that has a patient representative program. You go just what I told you. And here's the, here's the number. And just like, you can Google it and find it yourself. So I went and called them and said, hey, my kid has infantile spasms and I'm kind of into this advocacy thing, but kind of new and I, hey, can I, what can I do? And that's literally all I did. And they just took it from there and they gave me all my options and told me all the things that are going on. Now, if you have a, if you have a specific case and I, I deal with patients, patient access, you know, maybe there's an expanded access program and the patient missed the deadline and, and now they're trying, you know, that kind of situation, a very specific this is where I would first reach out to your organization. I would first reach out to MBIA and say, this is a, this is a situation, are you aware of it? And, and then I would you know, talk to Meg and say, are, are you aware of this situation? You know, what are we doing about it? Can I lead a working group? Can I, you know, can, can I help? How can I support? Because chances are they already know about it. But if not, then it's great to bring it to their attention because the group, the advocacy groups will have contacts and connections and, and that, that you might not as an individual have, and it might be outside of the purview of this patient engagement office. However, if you are part of that patient engagement by calling them up and saying, hey, put me on, put me in, you know, I just want to help. Then you have somebody who you can also, then you can tell Meg, then you can say, hey, I'm actually also uh, a patient representative, how can we leverage that to, to support this individual situation? But don't hesitate to just say, I don't know what I want to do, but just call me when you have something going on in my disorder. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Do we have any other questions? If, if anyone in the audience wants to raise their virtual hand, we can call on you or you can type your question in the chat. Danielle, I think this is wonderful. I, I struggled as well in the beginning. There are many times I, I call it my shame spiral where yeah. I feel like there's so much more I should be doing yeah. to save my child. And that's yeah. the thing is it feels very desperate yeah. at times in we want to do something, but we don't know what to do. Yeah. And you've given us some really tangible tools and, and resources that we can go after. I'm so glad. And, and also, I just want to say, don't ever feel bad if you need to step back. Don't ever feel bad if you, you know, you, maybe your kid is stable for a while and you think, oh, I can take on the world. Now I have to help all these other people. Don't ever feel bad about unfollowing a group, you know, stay in the group, but you know, if you have to unfollow a group, cause you can't stand to look at all the stories that remind you of triggering and, you know, of your PTSD, like be, take care of yourself and don't feel like you have to do everything all at once. I've been on boards that I had to step off of just because it was too much for me, or I had too much going on with work and caregiving. So yeah, I don't want you to feel like you have to do everything all at once. Sharing something on social media, like I said, social media is so powerful. It can take the place of a thousand person rally. You know, it, it, so just always remember that you, you always have the ability to, to influence change right from your living room or your, the hospital room as in many cases I have done. Thank you very much everyone for having me. And, and my email address is at the end of my presentation. Feel free to reach out anytime. Yes, thank you so much.